Hi, I'm Karen McNeil. Welcome to WineSpeed.com's People to Know, insider interviews with the most fascinating and important people in the wine business. And today we're here with Bartholomew Broadbent, the founder and CEO of Broadbent uh, Selections. And uh, so Bartholomew, I understand um, it was recently your birthday. You don't have to tell us how old you are, but I do want to know what you toasted with on that day. Oh, well, I don't really know. I, I, how could you not know? I'm not sure, but I, more importantly, was my father turn, turned 92 last year and then got married at the age of 92, so. That Michael Broadbent. I think <laughs> I'm gonna toast that sort of longevity. And yes. so you can, you can ask my age, but I'm a little bit less than him. <laughs> <laughs> yes, well, speaking of your father, Michael Broadbent, the famous Michael Broadbent, yeah. you know, you grew up um, at the knee of someone who was drinking many of the, the greatest old world wines. Um, but you, of course, chose to make your mark um, with your own company um, initially here and with, with new world wines. That was intel intentional? Tell us about that. Yeah, well, when I started Broadbent Selections, I wanted to have the best wines from each region and um, basically the best wines from France and Italy were already taken, taken up. So I went to the emerging regions and to be honest, what I did drink on my birthday was Gusborne English sparkling wine. I love that. Which I don't know if you call that new world or old world because England invented champagne, or yes. invented sparkling wine in, in Roman times. Yes. Um, so it's very old world, but um, yeah, so I went to New Zealand, I went to Portugal, I went to South Africa, Lebanon, all the emerging regions where I could get on, in, on the ground level in, in 1996. And mm -hmm. um, subsequently some uh, other Old world wineries have become available, so we're actually launching Italian wines this year. We're going to do a Brunello di Montalcino from Capanna and a Chianti Classico from um, Bindisagardi. Mm. But um, my favorite wine of all time, favorite red wine, is Chateau Musar. So from Lebanon. From Lebanon. And yes. Spy Valley is our biggest brand. Um, our Brabant Vino Verde is our single biggest skew. But um, but Chateau Mizar is one of our most important mm. as well. Now that's, a, that's an enormous range of, of wines from all over the world. Did you, um, do you remember having to develop a palate or was it kind of like, I don't know, a baby whose parent is a swimming instructor, instructor you just sort of always knew how to taste? Well, so I, my mother says I had wine before milk, I don't know if that's true, but certainly by the age of seven I was having wine every day um, when I was at home. My father would come home, he was with Christie's as you know, um, and so he would drink great, great wines almost every day and he'd bring bottles back for us to taste and make sure we tasted everything and at dinner we'd taste the wines. We would have orange juice and other things too, but he'd always make sure we tasted mm. the wine. So I think I basically developed a palate as a child. It's kind of like when you learn a language. I started speaking French when I was four because I went to a French school when I was four and stopped the French school when I was 11, but I can still have a perfect accent because I learned it so young. Mm. Um, and it's kind of like if you drink wine when you're really young, you can develop a, a, a sense of what's great and understand what's, what's um, great. So. So really my benchmark for greatness is, was established at a very, very early age. Yes, um, I can imagine. Now, I, I've, uh, I've heard you say, and I've also read, that you believe um, that great wine, um, the great producers of wine, always have very compelling stories to tell. That it's the story behind the wine that is really galvanizing. Um, give me an example of a, of a great story. Okay, so it would be really easy to say, what's your favorite wine? And you say, Chateau Lafitte. And that's really the end of the story because everyone knows what that is. Um, but when you say, what's your favorite wine? And you say, Chateau Musard from Lebanon, that's the beginning of a story. And that's got the greatest story of all times for wine. He's a wine who made, a winemaker who made wine throughout the Civil War in Lebanon mm. every single year and totally unique wines and totally organic wines and there's, there's just 
multiples of stories. You could talk for three or four hours about Chateau Mizar and not and not sort of end the mm. stories. Um, whereas most wines really don't have stories. But as important as the stories are per se in that regard, it's also the people who mm. I represent people. And to me, the the people you represent are, are, are incredibly important because you want to, it's life's too short to work with people you don't like or no. people who are not good. You want to have ethical people who are fun to work with and get on with the other suppliers in your portfolio and, and, and it's a family, you know. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Did you ever consider um, uh, going back to to Britain and I'm, I'm just thinking that the cachet of of uh, having a, a great portfolio, it just seems like London is such a, a hub for uh, for importers and distributors and people like you who select wine. But you you decided not only to stay here in the U.S. but actually to to live in Virginia. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I lived in San Francisco for 21 years after four years in Canada, um, and then I met a girl who I thought said Virgin, but it turned, be, turned out to be Virginia. <laughs> um, so, so I moved to Virginia, but um, it's an amazing state and we, they make great wines and it's a great restaurant city in Richmond. So it's, it, wasn't, it was a tough move at first 12 years ago from having been here for 21 years in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. but, um, but it's a really amazing um, culture of wine and food with the 300 wineries in Virginia. We represent Barbersville, which is sort of a top winery. Yes, and one of the oldest ones, right? Yeah. 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 Now, I know, um, you know, when I think about your, your father and his, his writing, and in fact, he is so famous, but in your own speaking, I know you've sometimes um, referenced your mother, Daphne, as having had a, also a very um, uh, strong influence on you. In, and she was, of course, something of the unsung hero behind Michael Broadbent. Totally. I mean, whenever my father did lectures throughout his life, she would be sitting by his side, usually writing letters to me at boarding school or when I was living in Canada or something, writing letters, and, but also taking his notes. And she'd have to um, take his notes, and then she'd be writing, and then she'd have to embellish with her own notes because she hadn't written everything he'd said. And, but um, when I started my company, Broadbent Sections, we wanted to start a Broadbent port and a Broadbent Madeira brand. And my <coughs> parents were such mad keen Madeira people that I sent them to the island to select the Madeiras. And my mother wrote me from Madeira saying, this wine's a deathbed razor. So I, I called her and said, this was before uh, emails and stuff, it was phone and stuff. I said, called her and said, well, what's a deathbed razor? And she said, well, if I was on my deathbed and someone gave me this, I'd just get up and go. I'd be fine. <laughs> Unfortunately, I didn't have a bottle of it to test the theory when she was on her deathbed, but I, oh. like, I don't know if it would have worked or not, but, um, yes. but she would appreciate the humor in that too. Oh my God. So she had a great palate <laughs> she had a great as well. Palette. Yeah, she had a brilliant palate. Yeah. Mm. And she was a brilliant cook too. And, and family meals were, it was never, um, this is what I'm cooking and my father Pairing the wine to it, it was always my father saying what we were going to drink, and then she had to design the meal around that. Right. And, and that's a, a skill that not many chefs can actually do, but no. she, she, she mastered it. Yes. It's the harder way to go yeah. as well. Now, speaking of Madeira, um, I know it's been a, a lifelong uh, passion for you, Madeira and mm -hmm. Port. What is it about Madeira that you think Americans initially didn't quite get, but they seem to be getting now. No, Americans got it from the start. You think? It was invented by well, America. Well, yeah, in because, the 1800s. Yeah, because, and, and it was the biggest selling wine in America until Prohibition. George Washington drank a pint a day. The Constitution and the, the Declaration of Independence were both toasted it. So American, America loved Madeira. It was your first tax loophole because it was not included in the circle when King James I said everything from Europe should be in, within the circle needs to be taxed. It was a little island off the coast of Morocco. Um, but it, after Prohibition, it never regained its foot and, until I was working for the Symington family um, and they bought the Madeira Wine Company and asked me to sell Madeira again. So we relaunched Madeira in 1989 and I think what 
people love about it and why it's so much more fun to sell than, than port is because it really appeals to the American um, sense of history. You know, mm. When you say the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence were toasted with it, Betsy Ross, when she was saying a flag, had a side table of Madeira on it. George Washington drank a pint a day for dinner. And you don't know this because all references to alcohol are removed from children's textbooks, but it's so intertwined with your American history. And we know that in England because we teach about wine in textbooks. Right. Um, but the fact is it's also a really delicious drink. It's got a more acidity, it's, it's more versatile, and, and, it, and I love, I have so many great stories about mm. Madeira that it goes with everything. In fact, um, I was doing a tasting at the Food and Wine Classic in Aspen, um, and on the panel with me was, it was a Madeira tasting. We had Robert Parker, who's a wine writer, and Julia Child, who was a chef, and a couple of Canadian guys. And right before the tasting, Julia said, bananas, you've got to have bananas. And I said, why? And she said, the best food and wine pairing in the world is bananas and Madeira. So I told little Nell, we've got to have bananas. And so they brought little bowls of bananas and they chopped them up and put them in front of everyone. And at the end of the tasting, um, someone said, excuse me, but why do we have bananas in front of us? And I said, oh, Julia, can you tell them why you wanted to have bananas? And she said, Oh dear, I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, but it's lovely stories that you can use to sell Madeira. And, and, but the, the wine is, goes with everything. It's got mm. such high acidity, it can go with balsamic. And, and it's yeah. a sweet wine, but a dry finish. So it goes with dessert when others don't. Oh, other I know. Don't. I mean, my, you know, here we are in the Napa Valley in my office. And the number of people who say, you know, oh, Cabernet and chocolate are so great. And I think, no, they aren't. They are awful. What goes with chocolate is Madeira. Or vintage port, or young vintage, vintage port. port. In fact, yes. that's why when I, when I was selling vintage port in, in 1986, I started in America. And um, the first vintage I launched was the 1985 vintage, which was being launched in 1987. And America didn't have preconceived ideas about port, whereas in England they drink it with Stilton cheese or mm. they won't drink it till it's 20 years old. And here no one knew anything, but here Americans have chocolate for dessert and it's a perfect wine for, a young vintage port is a perfect wine for, for chocolate. So America became the biggest market for vintage port in, in the world. Um, because of that association right. with chocolate desserts. I think it still is for vintage port, is it? Possibly, yeah, yeah possibly. I think so. Yeah. Now, did you ever, when you were starting your company, when you were starting Broadbent Selections, did you, did you ever actually consider not using the Broadbent name? <laughs> Have you been reading stories or hearing stories? Um, so when I started Broadbent Selections, it was quite funny because my father was a little bit annoyed. He s went to my yeah. mother and said, Broadbent, that's my name. And my mother said, Ooh. yeah, but it's his name too. Yeah. So, so yeah, no, I didn't, no, I didn't, um, I did actually consider um, maybe not using it. There's an old friend of my father's who's called Larry Feldman, who was in San Francisco. He was involved with wine circles, but he was more of a, um, a property investor or something. And, and I was talking to him um, about, you know, I'm thinking of, using the word broadband, but I really want to establish my own thing. And, and sure. he said, you'd be stupid not to use the word broadband. This is an asset, so why not use it? Yes. And, so, okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, and having, um, having had wine every day since the age of seven, I think you, you earned it. Um, yeah. yeah. Now, um, you know, I like often to ask people this question who have a a global view of wine, uh, which you certainly do. Do you think wine is, is good for a society, is inherently good for a society? It's the most civilized thing of any society. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, civilization started around wine. We were all moving around until we came across vineyards, and vineyards only produce grapes once a year, so you had to stay there. So you had to, so the first civilizations were established around vineyards. Um, you know, 9,000 or whatever, mm -hmm. how many thousands years, years ago. Um, but no, I think wine is, is a very civilized drink and most wine regions aren't warring regions. They're, they're civilized people 
you know, we've had two presidents who don't drink wine, and they're the least civilized presidents we've had. And mm. I'm sorry to say that on camera, but I think it's true that the, I don't trust people who don't drink wine, basically. <laughs> Well, I think there's going to be a tweet tomorrow about this, Bartholomew. Okay. We all know who you're talking about. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, and, and lastly, tell us something that um, most people would find surprising to know about you. Ooh. That's a really good question. I wish you'd prep me on that um, question because what would people say? I think that, I don't know, I think that I don't really understand that my father was as well known as he is. It sort of dawns on me more and more as I get interviews like this, but I grew up with him. He was already a master of wine in 1960. I was born in 62, get away my age. Um, and I just, to me, I think most people a surprise that I'm just normal, mm -hmm. just a normal person, you know. Mm -hmm. And I hope that comes across in a, not in an arrogant way, but but you know, I, I like people and, and I I like interacting with people. And I think that comes across in a very genuine way. Uh, yes. Good. <laughs> and our full interview with Bartholomew Broadbent is on WineSpeed.com's People to Know page. You won't want to miss it.